Hello, everyone. Welcome to Interia at ITF 118. Please take your seats. Um, OK, so we still have people coming into the room. Um, while we still have people walking into the room, uh, is there a, a note taker that can help us? Thank you very much, Stuart. Thank you. Excellent. I was going to say maybe like uh, Tommy Pauly said uh, last night at the Machu Picchu, we should uh, <laughs> offer some <laughs> incentive, but. You, you were faster, I appreciate it. Thank you very much. So yeah, next slide. So note well, uh, give me one second. Let me just yeah. All right, so this is a reminder of the IETF policies. Uh, mm -hmm. So again, this is an ITF uh, meeting and you agree to the ITF uh, processes and policies. So if you're aware of any contribution that is uh, covered by patents or patent applications, you must disclose the fact uh, or not participate in the discussion. You, uh, as an attendee, uh, agree that there will be written audio, video, and photographic records of the meeting. Uh, personal information that you provide will be handled in accordance with the privacy statement of the IETF. And as a participant or attendee, you agree to respectfully uh, treat other participants uh, in a professional manner. If you have any questions or uh, concerns, please contact the Ombuds team. Uh, any more details you can find on the BCPs on the screen. Next slide. So again, uh, please do not engage in, in any harassment while at IETF meetings, virtual meetings, social events. Uh, and you believe that you have been harassed or you notice that someone else has been harassed or have any other concerns, uh, please, uh, I, we encourage you to raise your concern and confidence to the ombudsperson. Okay. So uh, we ask you to log on to Mitico so that we can uh, keep your attendance. Uh, likewise, we are going to use uh, Mitico to, to handle the queue and please keep your audio and video off unless you are presenting. So some links there for the agenda, Mitico, the information, assistance, next slide. And um, okay, so this is our agenda for today. Uh, we start with the usual updates from the chairs. Uh, we're gonna get onto Tommy uh, with the proxy uh, configurations uh, in provisioning domains, trusted domain by Andrew, reverse trace route with uh, Valentin, revisiting the use of IP stack, Mark Blanchet, um, Asabi solution by Linke, uh, identification uh, extensions for the internet protocol from Fred, and time permitting, we had some late requests uh, from Ahmed on path tracing. SRV6 and IPv4 routes uh, with an IPv6 next hop from Julius. Are there any questions or comments on the agenda, bashing? All right, hearing none. So um, on our status updates, uh, we have two working group items. Uh, the first one is the IANA considerations. 
and ITF protocol documentation usage for IEEE 802 parameters. So that document has been discussed uh, for a while. Uh, it's now um, at the last stage in the RFC editor queue and pretty much uh, ready for uh, publication pretty soon. Um, then uh, we have the protocol numbers uh, for SHIC. That is the draft IDF Interia SHIC protocol numbers. And here we have a question mark because this document originally came from uh, the LP1 working group that was uh, dealing directly with uh, low power wide area networks. And SHIC is, is a protocol that was developed in that working group. And since then, uh, and when this uh, document came up and we, well, the discussion from Bob Moskowitz was to assign protocol numbers for SHIC as a, as a protocol. Uh, it was brought to, to Interia because it was a better home. Now things have changed uh, uh, over there. Uh, LP1 has become, uh, well, has finished, but now the SHIC working group was created, which is working on the specifics of this uh, protocol extensions and so on. So uh, the question is whether we should keep the protocol numbers for SHIC uh, in draft in Interia or send it now to the new SHIC working group. Um, I don't know if uh, anyone has any comment or views on this. Uh, Alex? Yes, uh, Alexander Pelf. So I'm a uh, chair of uh, the, the SHIC working group. And uh, there, of course, uh, if uh, uh, we'll be very happy to, you know, to progress with this, uh, with this document. Um, it depends in the working group here if you would like to, you know, continue that or if you want to hand over and then we can, we can do that. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much. So Eric Veng, the responsibility both for SHIC and for Interia. Uh, the new charter for SHIC, as you said, clearly indicates that we can work on either type, protocol numbers, UDP ports, so, and the like. So let's do this in SHIC. Of course, the working group last call will be done, extended to Interia as well, just to be sure we get the concerned people. Okay. Thank you very much. So hearing that, I guess uh, we'll do the, we'll move the knobs the right way to move the document to SHIC. Okay, thank you very much. So the next topic is uh, Tommy. Yeah, let me see how can I, you know how to grant? Can you stop sharing? All right, hello everybody. I'm Tommy Pauly from Apple, and um, I'll be presenting on communicating proxy configurations in provisioning domains. And this is a document that we uh, did present here in Interia last time, and we've done a 01 update and also added a co-author. So uh, welcome, Dragana from Microsoft. Um, so just to briefly uh, update on what we have changed since the 00, zero draft, uh, we took some of the feedback we heard uh, in the discussion last time, um, mainly minor changes. Uh, there's a well-known URI location, which is now going to be consistently used for finding this list of proxies, both from the related proxies as well as from uh, discovering from networks. This has a side effect of requiring that all proxies discovered in this way need to be co-located on the same uh, host name, or rather that all proxies on the same host name share the same uh, provisioning information about what a proxy is. <clears throat> and we also changed the structure, and this is uh, based on some discussion also with my co-author, um, to really focus on a single 
the, the primary use case for discovering related proxies when you already know about a proxy. Um, last time we presented two different use cases and I'll cover both of them today, but we wanna focus on that main one because the other one, which is about discovering proxies from the network is a bit more complicated and needs more considerations. Um, and we uh, highlight that in the draft, but don't have all the answers yet. That's what you all are for. Okay, so bubbling up, what is the use case here? Um, what we wanna enable is what we call like a related proxy discovery. So this allows us to very easily upgrade from a case where you know about a legacy proxy type, be that um, the name of an HTTP connect proxy or uh, the name of a SOX proxy and interrogate it and ask it, uh, do you have other more modern URI template based proxies like the things we're seeing developed in the mask working group and even within HTTP where the old style of connect is being replaced with a new connect TCP method. Um, so we have all of this work on proxies being done, but not a great mechanism for discovering configurations. So the steps here is very simple. The client knows about a simple proxy name. Maybe the user typed it in to their network settings in the UI. Maybe it came from a pack file. Maybe it came from WPAD. Maybe it came from a profile. And these things all configure based on just a host name. And so the client can simply issue a HTTPS query to a well-known URL, which is a PVD URL. This is something that the int area working group defined previously. And then we look in the JSON file we fetched there and we're just adding a new key, which is proxies. And so we can say, hey, this provisioning domain has a list of different proxy URLs. And if we're interrogating a proxy itself about its provisioning domain saying, hey, you're a proxy that offers access, essentially tunneled access through a proxy to something, what are the other ways I can use you to access those things? And we learn about the, the plain HTTP way we learn about the connect UDP support, we learn about connect IP, we, we learn more things from it. This also allows us to uh, solve some split DNS problems for proxies. If we can learn that this proxy configuration really is meant to access some internal resources or specific domains. Um, we already have DNS zones enumerated within a PVD JSON file. And this just defines how we associate those with a proxy. This is something that VPNs do commonly. Um, it's supported in uh, many different types, including Ike v2, but it's not supported today within proxies unless you go through a pack file. And we wanna avoid that in many cases. And then the other case, which is still mentioned in the document is at the bottom, which is a network provided proxy discovery where we use the traditional way of looking up a PVD um, from a router advertisement and we get a list of proxies. So we mentioned that this is something that can be enabled by the mechanism we've defined here, but there are also our dragons there. Um, so this is nice in that it's a potentially an avenue to define a standard alternative to WPAD and PAC, but those things have concerns sometimes around the security and privacy and should I trust this thing? And we don't wanna repeat those problems. Um, so at this point, the draft points out that this, this can happen, but that the client needs to have some policies about when it's okay to use this information. And I think this is something that we wanna see developed more. Um, some ideas of ways it may be okay to use a network discovered proxy is if the client is already going to use a proxy and this is just an alternative one. Or the proxy that it discovers is a well-known one on a list that it wants to trust. Um, or that we're using like a multi-hop chain of proxies such as uh, what we've been working on for private relay and we just want a first hop and there's no uh, really privacy or security posture of that first hop proxy. But it may not be okay to use proxies that we get from the network otherwise. Not certainly not just blindly sending all of our traffic to them. Um, so for open questions here, I think we need some more discussion around uh, how we identify the different proxy options and correlate them to protocols. Right now it's assumed based on the URI template format, but maybe we could have specific protocol identifiers listed there. And I think there needs to be a lot more discussion on network discovered proxies. 
And that's something that potentially could build on this document and build on how you use the new key we've defined for PVDs, uh, but not try to pack that all into this one. So what I'm here to ask you is please review the document, share your thoughts. Uh, let us know if this is something that Interior would like to work on. Um, Interior has worked on PVDs before. It's worked on proxies before. This doesn't really clearly fit within HTTP or other groups that are working more on how we talk to the proxies. This is more about how a network or a provisioning domain is configuring the proxies within it. Also, we'd be interested to test this out with anyone who would like to start using this. So we've got a queue. Yes. All right. We have Eric first. Uh, Eric Klein, so uh, no hats. Uh, I, I read this, I think, when you first posted it. Uh, I support adoption and, and working on it. I was going to say, if you go back to slide seven, I think one of the, one of the many things you could probably add to this list is uh, handling uh, duplicate or overlapping domain namespaces. You have multiple proxies that all claim to be the, uh, the way to get to the same place or some place that has names that overlap. Yeah, that, that's a great point. And I, I, I think that comes up particularly when you're getting something that were discovered, because in the other case where I already know about a proxy and I'm intending to use it for some things, it can tell me, only give me a subset of those things. So, you know, cases where we have split domains that are reducing scope is mm -hmm. safer. Mm -hmm. But when we have multiple things saying, please use me, that's where it gets scary. Thank you. Thanks. Ted? Uh, Ted Hardy, mock enthusiast. And indeed, I was trying to think about this, hmm. and whether or not there might be a, a problem with people who are intending to provide Connect UDP proxies but don't want mock running through them because the video traffic needs guarantees that they don't intend to provide, or where the United might need to be able to distinguish between uh, the mock t appropriate UDP and the mock t inappropriate UDP proxies if you're providing both. And the way I'm reading the document right now, what I'd need to do is provide you with two different URI schemes, one of which is like the proxy specific to mock T, and then you'd know that that was the right one if it was present, but it doesn't tell me how to tell you that if there's a UDP one that doesn't want mock T, what I should do. Exactly, and I, I think, that's one of the things I think that needs to be worked on, kind of to this first point about understanding what it's for. Um, and in the last time uh, in San Francisco when we presented this, one of the questions that was brought up are, what are the other properties of a proxy that we need to associate with them to know when it's appropriate to use one or the other or have them constrain themselves? So I think what you're getting at here means like just having a plain list that has no other associated information is insufficient. You, I'm, I'm actually wondering whether using ALPN associated with something yeah. like um, this might be more useful than, um, I mean, UDP to, to know what base protocol it is, but then limit the ALPN struct in some way so you know which ones you're supporting and which ones you're not. Right. I mean, I, I can almost imagine like a like you know, a, a dictionary mapping of you know URI to list of ALPNs where I can have a wild card for anything UDP if I want it. Yeah. Okay, um, I'm Great definitely idea. interested in, in seeing how this progresses. Uh, no opinion about whether it's here or elsewhere. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Josh? Hi, can you, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, hi. Um, my name is Josh Cohen. I am one of the original co-authors of WPAD, which is the, the current solution. Um, I just wanted to point out a few things. Uh, I on October 27th, I posted a, an email to the interior list, which is kind of a walkthrough of how the current version came to be, uh, the early state of the web and the internet. Like for example, DHCP wasn't really fully deployed yet. It kind of explains the thinking on it and the scenario. So I'm posting those links to the chat. Um, I'm definitely happy to see evolution on this uh you know when we did it 25 years ago things like the uh dns devolution scheme which is a huge headache um was really like the only thing that could work and it was meant to be a short-term solution so i guess 25 years is short term if you 
I'm thinking about things in the long term, <laughs> taking the long view. Um, so I'm happy to see that Microsoft and Apple are cooperating. This is the kind of thing where proxies confuse users. And so the more we can have a common experience, the more we'll enable the other things we want to do that depend on these things. So, um, you know, I'm happy to participate in the conversations and um, look at the network discovery side, which can certainly be updated to use things like server loc, um, depending on how a given IT admin wants to administer their network. So I'm looking forward to the evolution of this. Great. Thank you. And I uh, look forward to l learning from you about uh, how, how, to, how to do and not do the network-based discovery from all your yeah. experience there. I'm at the ready. Thanks. Mirja? Mirja Kulevin. So I think this is a very useful work. It adds uh, proxy configuration discovery to systems that already deploy PBDs. And it, I think that's also a perfect place where it fits. Um, I just want to talk about the discovery um, part on your previous slide. I think this is already a very good list you have here. Um, the, the previous slide. Yeah, so the list of kind of the safeguards or however you want to say it. I'm especially interested in the last case where you basically have a proxy setup that needs very little trust. And therefore it's like, you know, not harmful to discover it in an untrusted way um, because you provide like the, the security properties you want over the proxy setup in a different way. So I think this is a very good use case we should focus on. The other use case would be you have like a trusted environment to discover the thing, but that is, needs much more consideration. I think this, this, this first use case is already very important. Thank you. Thanks. Suresh? Yeah, thanks. Suresh. Uh, thanks, Tommy. So it looks good. Uh, totally up for it. I, I think the, uh, the heuristics for what protocol to use, I'm not very comfortable with. So probably yep. pull it out and make it explicit is like my recommendation. Also. So. I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you, Eric. So Eric Vink, uh, simply to say, I mean, the call for adoption is for the group, of course, not for me, but I think it's pretty fit here. And I will ask the chair that when we raise the can Group last call, we send the can Group last call to other groups as well. All right. Thank you. I think that drains the queue. Yes. So thank you. Thank you very much, thank you. everyone. OK, so the next one line is uh, Andrew. You want to share from your phone or you want to, you want to share from your phone? You want us to uh, share? We have you can share. Okay. Yes. Just do the. No, no you won't. Hello all. Um, firstly, thanks for being here to listen to us talk about this again. Um, so we want to talk a little bit about the trusted domain SRV6 draft um, and give a little bit of an update from where we were last time we presented this. So just a quick recap um, as to why this document exists. SRV6 has some known security vulnerabilities. Should a packet be able to enter the SRV6 domain. Um, and these are quite clearly stated in 8402 and 8754. Um, we don't believe that LPM filtering at the borders um, is scalable um, or practical in an operational sense. Some people may find that it's practical through automation, et cetera. Our experience says that we would yeah, we don't find that a particularly scalable approach. Um, we can go to the next slide. Um, in this presentation, there are two URLs there which do document some of the attack vectors. Um, the spring security um, considerations document, there's a, quite a bit of work being done in spring on this as well. Um, and we think that those documents simply 
highlight the issues that we're, we're trying to solve. I think, next slide. Um, there we go. So what did we want with this draft? We're aiming to give operators the ability to protect themselves or their customers by allowing a very clear way to distinguish SRV6 from IPv6. We had certain very clear requirements when we came up with this. Um, namely, we didn't want to rework SRV6. What is in SRV6 had to remain because there's a lot of work, a lot of effort, a lot of good work that's gone into that. And there's no point in trying to reinvent it to secure it. We didn't want anything that would have to change silicon because the moment that you've got to touch silicon and bake new stuff into silicon, well, that's expensive and it takes a long, long time. We want to enhance the deployment appeal of SRV6. The reality is, is that while there are people that will choose to run SRV6 without the ether type, and that's fine because this is entirely optional, there are other group of people that will never run SRV6 without the ether type. And in our view, with the vendors having put in as much work as they did to this, they obviously want it deployed as widely as possible. And by giving operators an option to deploy this in a way that makes the operator feel secure, and again, it is optional, that enhances the value proposition of all the work that has gone in and it is actually in the economic interests of the vendors, et cetera, to support this because the technology will get more widely deployed. Um, if we can go to the next slide. So how do we accomplish this? There's a global knob on the device that says, I want to run this thing in trusted domain mode, which basically means that I want to only process SLV6 SIDs if they're coming in from a trusted domain packet with a new ether type. Then on the interface, we say, here's a knob, turn this on. This interface now supports SRV6 processing, which means it'll process the ether type. It's basically identical to how MPLS currently works, where you simply say within MPLS, the interface either supports it or it doesn't, and you have to explicitly enable it. That's what makes this a fail closed um, version of SRV6. We were trying to make this fail closed without further filtering. Um, next slide there. Um, as a note on this, it may be possible to run TD SRV6 while running standard SRV6 in a hybrid mode. From the author's perspective, we're not sure that this is a particularly good idea. But there are ways to do it. But we've chosen to leave this explicitly out of scope of this document. Um, if anybody wants to work on a document that covers this kind of hybrid mode, feel free to contact me. I'm happy to talk. Um, and yes, so we chose to leave that kind of hybrid island scenario where you turn on the ether type, turn it off again, then turn it on again, and turn it off again through the network out of scope um, because we believe that, that it has its own concerns and own challenges. Next slide. So since the last time I presented this, we've made some language changes just to update for clarity. And we also added an applicability section um, that tried to deal with some of the concerns that we heard in here. Where is this applicable? Where is this not applicable, etc. cetera? Um, fairly basic. Um, changes, nothing really major, but I think that they were an attempt to address the concerns that were raised in the last meeting. Um, next. Um, we would like to see an adoption call for this. Now, in saying that, we know that if the working group feels that this isn't ready for adoption, tell us, and then we'll come and, you know, see when it, a more appropriate time is. But again, I want to stress that in this draft, because it's a question that we keep getting asked, this draft creates an optional mechanism. It is not 
mandatory. So you can continue to run your SRV6 exactly as you would if you choose to do so. This simply gives operators an option. And so, yeah, this is our asking for an adoption call. And if anybody's got any questions, thanks very much for hearing me out. Thank you. So we have a couple of people already in the queue. Uh, Jan? Hello, Jan George, Six Connect. From an operational point of view, SRV6 is not IPv6. It's far away from IPv6. Therefore, it should have an ether type. And I hope that uh, the first option running SRV6 without new ether type goes away as fast as possible. Thank you. Thank you. Shin? from NTT. Then one thing, you know, basically, as I said, that you know, basically I'm supporting this, you know, as you said, but you know, then is this optional if we define the Ethernet type? Then by doing that, you know, maybe assuming that the BGP, you know, pairing, for example, pairing V6, but you know, not to do that for the SR V6 you know, completely. Then in that case, we should eliminate SR6 function from an IP version 6 implementation, isn't it? So we realize that there are people out there who have deployed this in that way. And just like in a network where you can run MPLS, where some interfaces are MPLS enabled and yeah. some aren't, we've created the same thing here where you've got that option. Personally, from my perspective, I would love to say use the ether type always. But I also believe that the market needs to make a decision here. We are putting an option into the market and saying to the market, you can choose to run it this way or you can choose to run it that way. And that also allows people who have already deployed this to not go and rework their networks. I, I fully understand the position but I have to respect the will of the market. Yeah. And that's why we've chosen to make this optional. Okay. And also, just a last question I have is and not from the BGP board allowed those things, but then you mm -hmm. think trust domain may be defined from the access, you know. Yes. I mean, from, from our perspective, if I were to look at as an operator my own network, I would not trust MPLS packets coming in from the access side or from the peers or from my cloud stacks. Yeah. And I would limit the domain based you know, on those criteria. Other operators may have a different view on this. you know, And hence, again, it's optional. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> Ken G, Mobile. Um, I attended your session in San Francisco, and then I asked some questions. And last night I compared draft 01 and 02. Hardly I can find uh, some significant change. So let me ask the similar questions I have asked in San Francisco. The first, in San Francisco I asked, okay, how are you going to handle the business operational burden? Like we have tens of thousands routers that, has to, that have to be upgraded, you know, one by one. And then this is a really significant amount of operational cost. Okay, the second question is, I think this one is unnecessary if it is not reinventing the wheel. The thing is, we have so many tools already, like uh, echo list, uh, uh, prefix list, filter list, all kinds of things we can apply. And here, well, even if you do get your ether type, uh, you know, you apply it on your header, you still have to get something, like you, you are using your Mac list or something to filter. You're still going to configure something. So it's just like, a, you know, you have the tool already, and then you just create a new ether type, and then you still have your Mac list, your echo list to do the work. So it's like, a, you know, unnecessary. Uh, okay, can, can I take your questions one at a time so that I don't forget that, right? Let okay. me just address your first question. Okay. Firstly, again, this is optional. And 
you don't have to run this. So if you've got SRV6 already deployed on 10,000 devices, it keeps working. If you were to roll out any new feature or you were to develop a bug in your iOS or your root operating system that affected 10,000 devices, you would have to go and upgrade them. If you want to roll out any new feature developed by the IETF, you would have to go and upgrade them. This is the same thing, but this is optional. You're not forced to do this, but the argument that you would somehow incur additional overhead deploying this that you wouldn't occur, incur on any other new feature that required an operating system, it doesn't hold because that's the way that it is. With regards to the second part of the question and the map lists, et cetera, if you look at an MPLS device, an interface by default is not configured for MPLS processing. In this particular case, if you have turned on the SRV6 trusted domain knob, and only if you've turned that on, you will need to explicitly on an interface say, this is enabled, otherwise it fails closed. That's the same as MPLS. It does not require any additional access lists. It requires the router on the interface to be configured to process the ether type in a fail closed scenario. That's okay. That's a good. Actually, your answer lead, lead to the third question I have here. So you you are using this one to designate a trusted domain. Actually, the, within the trust domain, you have uh, some routers with your new ether. Some does not. Actually, it's like a failed domain. See, within for some router without your new ether type processing, the ASIC is going to drop blindly. Although originally, you know, just it's going to do it because you have new ether, the chip cannot handle it, drop it. So basically it's failed in your trust domain. The, the last one, like here, you ask for a new ether tab. It's like an empty check. So issue the check. Later, some other people try to do, oh yeah, I got another feature. I need another new ether tab. I can use the same argument. You know, I can do the gradual deployment, everything I can use your argument. To do okay, I knew I need a new ether tab. One, new tab two. I use your new, I use your argument. So let me cover the last one first. When you need a new code point for whatever protocol, you go and get a new code point. Nobody has a problem with that. But that and is only no, that, absolutely necessary to configure something. And I'm saying to you that in the author's viewpoint on this we are creating a fail-closed security mechanism. Firstly, the argument about the ASICs dropping it if it's configured, that only happens if you've turned this on. It's optional. What we're saying is once you turn it on, yeah, it uses an ether type, but just like you can go and apply for a new code point and we don't see, well, in some cases, you know, some protocols, you may see loads of code points, but the simple point is that you've got to go and apply for the code point. You've got to get the ether type. You've got to develop something to run on it. And you'd have to develop the software. That's no different from what is current. All we're doing is creating a situation where the operators have a choice. And we're not telling anybody to run this. We're saying give the operators who do not feel secure running without this a choice. That's all we're asking for. Okay, so I still hope the group will just try to justify, to balance the pros and the cons, to look at all the, the four bullets I just list there to consider this job. Thank okay. you. Thanks. Uh, we're running uh, out of time, so one last comment. Yeah. Well, the, the queue is closed. One, one comment or one last comment, because I got two comments. Oh, go ahead. So please. first, <laughs> Andrew, sorry. Uh, as an individual contributor, we don't talk about this, I'm still, Hesitating between is fascinating, but I also ambivalent, right? I see the pro and pro. I like the optional approach. Anyway, it will be up to the working group to decide on this one. And now, with my head yet, uh, process-wise, sorry about that. You are alluded to it. Is it now or later? I'm afraid that the call for adoption needs to be delayed until first draft 
has gone through, you know, with the prefix, has gone through IFG evaluation. We should get it on our ballot anytime 100%. soon. Eric, it's a message for you. <laughs> Travi <laughs> joke, Travi joke. And the other one is the one in spring that started this morning. Uh, it's still pretty. Can I make a comment on that, Eric? Yeah, so, but anyway, we yes. need to wait for this one. Right? Yeah, but, but just to respond to that comment, on Suresh's draft, we actually see that draft as complementary. We don't, yes, 100% complementary. Maybe. On, on the draft in spring, um, I had a chat this morning with Jim mm -hmm. um, as the spring AD, and he tells me that in his view, the two drafts are orthogonal to each other, um, that they are not, one does not hold up the other because the one simply says, here are a bunch of concerns. That's what it does. It's a considerations draft. This says, here is a solution, probably not to all of those concerns. And we've come up with a way that does, you know, deal with a particular concern, which is well documented in multiple emails, multiple list posts. And what we are simply saying is, we're happy to wait if that's what you would like us to do. But from the spring AD's perspective and my perspective, these two things are orthogonal to each other. I kind of, kind of agree with you in the sense they are not overlapping, but one is the suite or the sequence of the other one. How can you fix a security problem if you don't get the trend analysis done correctly? So, so anyway, yes, yes, but just one comment on that. Sure. When you are looking at software and you have an iOS image, for example. For example. And yeah, and you find a bug in it and you're busy doing the whole code audit. Do you wait for the entire code audit, which could take months, or do you patch the bug while the code audit is continuing? But you have identified a bug, which is not really the case. Anyway, I think we need to wait until for the adoption. It does not prevent yep. you and the authors to work on it, obviously, right? A hundred percent. And we, we would love more feedback, you know, more discussion. We welcome the comments um, and we stand ready to work, you know. And, and I'm, I'm really hoping that Nick and his team in, in spring will go fast because we do need this. Yeah. Cool. Thank, Thank you, guys. Thanks, everyone. Uh, so please uh, continue the discussion on, on the mailing list. Uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, comments also on the chat, so you're welcome to exchange uh, right now in the chat. But uh, on the group, we're moving now to Valentin. Um, today, I would like to talk about Reverse Trace Route. It's a draft that Rolf Winter and I developed um, together. And yeah, let's get to it. Sorry. Um, so first, I want to discuss the problem at hand, why we even need Reverse Trace Route. I mean, most of you already know it, but I still want to reiterate. So assume we have the following topology at hand. And we are sitting in front of the client and talking to www.example.com. And we have some problems with the connection, might be a high latency or whatever. So we fire up trace route at our console on the client, and we might get the following output, which you can see on top. And this would be like a typical trace route output. And when we have a look at it, we can see that, well, the first three hops, they look normal. We've got a small round trip time. And then the round trip time from hop four onward, well, it has a spike. And from this measurement, um, one might falsely induce that we have a problem on the forward path. 
um, between hop three and four because that's where the first spike in the run trip times occurs. But as an outside observer, when we have a look at the entire topology, we can actually see this is not the case. Now, the reason why um, this trace route output might falsely lead us to believe that we have a problem between the router C and D is that even though classic trace route is able to um, illuminate the forward paths, um, the reverse path still contributes to the round group time measurements of the forward path. So all in all, we need the entire picture to um, correctly troubleshoot. And that's where reverse trace route comes in because we not only need the forward traces, we need the reverse traces as well. So trace route and um, reverse trace route in particular is not a new idea. It dates back to 1993, um, where it was first implemented via an IP option. And the way it worked was that um, a client, for example, sent an ICMP echo message towards the server and appended this IP option um, to the IP header. And now each router on the way um, examined this IP option and then sent back a trace route message um, to the originator. And this way, um, the originator, the client, could collect all the messages from the router and examine the forward path. Um, now, upon receiving, um, um, now when the destination receives this packet, it can um, send back a response, and it still keeps the IP option in that which the originator's address is encoded. And this way, on the reverse path as well, um, the client can collect all those um, trace route messages. And this is how um, reverse trace route was performed. But unfortunately, this attempt had a few shortcomings, one of which was it relied on router support. The routers needed um, to examine the IP headers um, to know these IP options and to act upon them. And this is one of our major design goals in our new reverse trace route draft. We do not want to touch routers. We want to leave them untouched. Um, the burden for this protocol um, should fall onto the endpoints. Um, now to the message exchange. Um, we propose the following um, exchange. We have a client which can request reverse trace route measurements from a server, and it does so via ICMP. We think that ICMP is a good fit because it is already used for diagnostics, uh, so why not build up on it? Also, it is ubiquitously available on endpoints, so that's another good point. Now the client sends an ICMP reverse trace route message to the server. The server can then pass this message and examine its configuration. In this example, the client requested a reverse trace route measurement um, with a given protocol. This might be UDP, ICMP, or TCP, and a given um, time to live in this example too. Now this configuration leads um, to the probe, which is then um, issued back to the client from the server to expire at router E. Um, this is just a regular trace route probe. It's nothing special. Now router E um, sends a time exceeded message back to the server in classic trace route fashion, and the server is now able to calculate the round trip time between step two and step three. And augmented information with the source address of the um, probe's response. And um, together, this concludes the measurement, and we relay this information back to the client. So the client is able um, to request um, hop by hop, packet by packet measurements from the server. And we want to do it in this um, packet per packet fashion um, to minimize the possible attack surface for amplification attacks. Um, yeah, let's dig into the code points. Um, I already said um, we want to use ICMP. And that's actually quite nice because ICMP is defined for v4 and v6. And ICMP messages start as follows. We have a type, we have a code, checksum, and then some message-specific data. And now we have to ask the question, do we want to define a new type for reverse trace route to use? Or do we want to build on existing types and use new codes to designate reverse trace route messages as such? And well, really, um, the choice boils down to the answer to the following question, and that is, which one does actually work on today's internet? Um, so to answer this question, we performed a few measurements on middle boxes at first. These were typical home gateways. And through each of those um, 12 home gateways, um, we sent a few packets. We first started by sending um, typical ICMP um, echo messages. This is actually pink. 
but we didn't use the standard code. Instead, we used new codes. So we extended ICMP echo with the types 1 and 2 for this measurement and sent them through those gateways. And actually, those gateways were able to handle those packets quite well. 11 out of 12 implementations correctly forwarded their requests and their corresponding responses, which were also um, using types 1 and 2 respectively. So with deployability in mind, extending ICMP echo with new code looks like a new, uh, sorry, looks like a good fit. Now only your single implementation dropped the actual response, but well, that's not so bad as a result. Um, if we have a look at using new types um, for reverse trace route messages, it doesn't look so good. Only a single NUT implementation was able to um, forward new ICMP types and actually, most of these implementations really just dropped them. This is what, what filtered means. Um, now, the last column is actually quite funny because this is actually faulty behavior. What the NUT implementations did um, was that they thought that they don't know this type and, well, they just thought, I won't translate the source address. I will just send this out, packet out with a private address into the public internet. So they didn't even bother to perform well the translation. So as we can see from this measurement, um, when we want reverse trace route messages to be deployable, um, we clearly have to build upon the existing ones because when even home gateways um, are not able um, to handle new um, message types, then we won't have a chance. Um, but the fact that um, these ICMP echo types with new codes made it through um, the nut boxes doesn't mean that we have a guarantee that they will also make it through the public internet. Um, this is why we performed another measurement. And this time we picked 10 million IPv4 addresses at random. And to each of those, we sent a ping to filter out the responsive ones. Now to each host that responded, we sent um, another ICMP echo with the new code, code one. And well, we observed the responses and categorized them as follows. Now, what filtered means is that we didn't get a response back to the ICMP echo code one requests. Um, reflective means that we get, did get back a response and the responses type actually matched the request, sorry, that the responses code actually matched the requests code. So we sent a type eight code one packet to the servers and the server sent back a type zero code one. And this is good news because this means that these type eight code one and type zero code one messages, they make it across the public internet unfiltered and unaltered in the vast majority of cases, which means um, we can rely on them um, if we want reverse trace route to be deployable. Unreflective means um, that we got back a regular echo response, typical type zero code zero and erroneous is the entire rest. Um, most of them were destination unreachable packages and packets, sorry. Um, well, all in all, to conclude this presentation, um, for the message exchange, which I depicted before a few slides ago, um, we will be using in our draft um, these ICMP echo messages, and we want um, to assign a new code for these messages so that we can start deploying reverse trace route well as early as possible. Well, now to the conclusion. This is not our first presentation of reverse trace route. Actually, um, Rolf Winter, the co-author of the draft, he already presented um, reverse trace route at the DNO 14. It's a network operator event and we got positive feedback. So the operators um, there clearly liked our proposal. We have running code on GitHub for both v4, v6, client and server. The server is implemented via eBPF. So we can intercept the ICMP packets before they are processed by the kernel network stack, client is Python. We will have Debian packages available, still working on the documentation though, but soon they will be online. And as for the next steps, um, we would like to finish the protocol design and for this we need feedback because at this point we have none. So if you have opinions, be it good or bad, please participate in the discussion and write something on the mailing list. And of course it would be a huge milestone if at the end um, the working group could adopt this. Well, that's it. Thanks for your time. Thank you. Um, 
So we have uh, Tobias, maybe. If you guys can make it short, then we will be able to get more comments. Thank okay. you. Okay. Um, Tobias Max Planck Institute for Informatics. Uh, I would be interested which 11 implementations you tested. Um, okay. I don't have this at hand, but I can get you the complete list um, if you leave me your contact info. Okay. I think that is crucial to see whether there might have been a merger of implementations. And the other thing is what my biggest concern with this draft is, is that it is uh, basically um, more like a daemon than an end-to-end -end connectivity, which could be on ICMP. Um, what do you mean it's more like a daemon? Can you explain? Um, there, there is more state in it than an end-to-end -end, uh, exchange of ICMP messages. Like yes, that's a good point. We have to maintain state specifically um, for the round trip time measurements. Eric? Yeah. Uh, Eric Klein, so no hats, I, I, I would tend to agree. Um, but uh, with an IESG hat on, have you looked at um, anything in IPPM? IPPM, no, not yet. Because they have a one-way and two-way measurement protocols that do a whole lot of stuff. And I'm pretty sure I read some stuff that sounds an awful lot like this. Yeah, OK. But we want um, this work to be available on the entire public internet. So every user should be able to use them and, well, I think when you're talking about wanting it on the public internet, you're going to run into a pretty high, high, a high barrier. I would suspect. Thank you. Yeah. Eric Vink, uh, individual contributor in this time again, like, like Eric. So I was about to say <laughs> what he say. Uh, you should really at least present your draft or send your draft to the IPPM mailing list or even opposite with VG. And pretty much like Thomas, I don't like having ICMP installing states in the router. So I would prefer to have the first packets being over UDP. Oh, and sorry. Then... Um, we don't store any state in routers at all. We don't want to touch routers. This is the server really just wants on the endpoint. Oh, okay. oh, the end. Oh, sorry. But you could implement this in routers, yeah. by the way. Uh, but I want to say another thing. I mean, the endpoint itself can actually limit the number of sessions. So you can limit the state. So it won't just overflow. All right. Thank you very much. Yep. Thank you. So we have uh, Marc Blanchy. Good afternoon, or good morning, or good evening, or good night. Um, so I'm going to talk about uh, IP uh, use in deep space. And while they're loading the slide deck, um, two things to start is uh, when I say deep space, I mean something uh, further than LEO or GEO or NEO. Um, you know, moon, Mars. <clears throat> ah, okay, thank you. Um, well, maybe if you go back just one. Back. Oh, okay. So this is about the draft is uh, on the URL that the draft where I'm talking about is there. Next slide. And I'm with a few friends. Um, so uh, deep space has a few uh, um, characteristics. Well, actually many, but um, some such as delays are four to 20 minutes, for example, one way to Mars. Uh, disruptions are typical uh, planned. You know that it will happen because of orbital dynamics or unplanned because of all kinds of things happen. Um, one could say that uh, you know, for moon, which is a few seconds away, you could kind of tweak stuff. Um, we're trying to look at the harder problem, which is Mars, and hopefully moon would be simpler. Um, the current state is that the IOAG, which is the Interagency Operations Advisory Group, which is a corporation of all most agencies, uh, stating that they want to practice uh, technologies on moon first, so that they would be used on Mars and elsewhere. Um, history of this is that the um, 
almost 20 years ago, uh, there was an RFC uh, that uh, has essentially assessed that IP was not suitable for that environment. Therefore, a new protocol stack was to be uh, uh, designed and it's called a bundle protocol. It's actually uh, been uh, worked uh, first in the research uh, um, as a research group and then an ITF group. I was the co-chair for some time. And, um, and it's still a working group, it's called DTN. Next slide, please. And uh, the idea here is to see, uh, not necessarily saying B, uh, BP or bundle protocol is good or bad, it's just more, you know, reassessment and see if an alternative can be used, uh, can be done using standard IP, our IP, IP protocol stack as useful. Because, uh, you know, given, without going to details, but the protocol is really like a, at the IP layer, which is um, you send a message in, like in a bottle and it goes somewhere. Uh, you need to add all those kinds of network services such as routing, naming, neighbor discovery, network management, security, all this uh, with BP. And it, to me, it's kind of a, like reinventing uh, what we already have in IP. Uh, therefore, uh, instead of given the advancement of internet protocols uh, uh, since 20 X uh, years ago, uh, like Quick, for example, all the work we've, we've been doing with that uh, IoT, energy sufficient uh, uh, things, savings, uh, unconnected networking, and name it. And the fact that the usage of IP protocol stack is actually changing, you know, like HTTP is kind of done in, in nowadays, then why don't we relook at it? And this was actually triggered a lot of interest from various uh, space organizations. So not only space agencies, but actually private sector, which is getting big nowadays. Next slide. So um, you probably have already uh, 10 questions in your head about <laughs> what about this and this and this. I go for uh, over the, the, the protocol stack and that's the challenge of this work, which is we're looking at the different levels of the application uh, of the protocol stack. Uh, and you know we can spend probably a lot of time uh, in uh, um, at the end the uh, the discussion uh, the last slide is there's a uh, side meetings uh, going on this week one is at six uh, to, tonight um, so one of the questions is is this really internet in space uh, yeah yes and no and mostly no so end users should you know don't expect end users to actually you know browse to Mars or things like that, those networks would be air gap uh, with a 40 minutes RTT uh, and disruptions. You can't do, you know, SSH or web browsing as we do or real time apps as we do. There's ways to kind of uh, make it, make them working kind of, but you know, that's not the purpose. It's more reusing the IP prescription protocol stack for uh, deep space use and for applications that are space related, not for end users. Next slide. So this is like the protocol stack. Um, uh, so quick UDP, HTTP and apps and some apps maybe or protocols over UDP. Uh, TCP is obviously not well suited for that. Uh, but quick is kind of a, our now a transport Swiss knife, which uh, our um, uh, the team uh, uh, work uh, actually found that uh, it seems possible with tweaking a few uh, timers and quick uh, that we could actually make it work over long delays and, uh, and, and intermittent uh, um, um, links, but uh, more work to do. So as you could see on the other, on your right, uh, that the main, same stack would be on the surface of a celestial body such as Moon or Mars or in the orbit, and then deep space would be IP, so a full single layer. Next slide. So if I go from our bottom of the stack going up, uh, if you think about IP forwarding, IP has no notion of time. Obviously, I'm preaching to the, <laughs> the people who know that. Uh, so TTL and op limit are just a number of ops, but the forwarding means that you have a route in the forwarding table that is available. 
to the destination. But if your link is down, you know, the far link to the destination is down because, you know, orbital uh, mechanics, then there's no route to destination. So the idea here is to store the packet, IP packet, instead of dropping it and sending the ICMP uh, unreachable destination unreachable until a new window of computation interface is up and the route is established. Um, so we have implemented this. There's a few ways to do this uh, out of the kernel. Uh, one is uh, using uh, um, uh, uh, TC, on Linux TC uh, Q, 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 uh, queuing discipline. Um, and you could do this with the ton interfaces. Next slide. I know I'm going fast, but. No, it's good. <laughs> so IP routing, uh, you know, uh, uh, we, it, with IP addressing, we can enable aggregation. Therefore, if you have uh, some links and a few providers on Moon, for example, then, or Mars, then you can announce those prefixes through our routing. Uh, and this would be like a few entries. Uh, which is kind of more difficult in the other way of doing with bundle protocol. Uh, so we could do static, uh, given there's a kind of small number of devices, you know, sending devices to space costs a lot. So it's not like, you know, IoT in your uh, home. Or st therefore, static could be just fine, uh, RIP, or simple routing protocols, or uh, uh, what is being discussed in time variant routing uh, working group is to with the knowledge of the intermittent, intermittent uh, windows of communications, which is all known in advance in space, you could kind of inject this into your routing uh, engine and make it smarter decisions of routing. Um, next slide. Uh, transport is uh, really a, a key component here because if we don't have transport, uh, you know, then so, uh, and quick seems to be, uh, to be a good candidate. Uh, initial, again, initial uh, testing uh, seems that with a few uh, change in the timers, the key one is the initial RPT one. Uh, there's a few, there's act frequency and, you know, act delays, and, but I don't want to go in too much into transport discussions there. Um, uh, congestion control algorithms, uh, things like that. Um, Next slide, there's a draft at the end. Let's uh, discuss that uh, more in details. Next slide. Um, so HTTP is uh, something that, you know, is essentially has no notion of time. I had a good discussion with uh, Mark Nottingham about this, except for a few others you, you probably know, like uh, the expression of data, caching things. So use the proper headers with the proper values. Uh, HTTP or OS text as often short timers but they're usually configurable. So, you know, configure them appropriately. Next slide. Um, the first comment here is a way to, to get people reacting. <laughs> we do have other than HTTP based application and protocol, but <laughs> just to get, you know, people awake. Um, so yeah, we should, you should support other than non -H uh, HTTP, you know, non HTTP based application and protocols. But. Email is probably the simplest one because it's all, you know, forward, so and forward. Next slide. Um, naming, uh, if you're deploying naming, uh, since you have an IP network, uh, you know, DNS is kind of uh, useful. Uh, so if you have uh, an, I an IP network on Moon or Mars or else, then uh, you would deploy some kind of uh, DNS, but uh, it requires kind of a caching on steroids in some ways. So that, you know, and obviously the resolving uh, request won't go through the deep space things. So there's a draft that discuss about that. Next slide. Um, we would do, as you may remember in the slide that has the, the stack, there's IP over space things, uh, the CCSDAO, CCSDS, which is the Consultative Committee for Space Data Systems, the SDO for space comms, and I, you know, in general, as a specified IP encapsulation over space things, but it is under spe specified, that's my, you know, my take on this. Um, it only says, uh, like, uh, if you encap v4 or v6 packet, here's the code point for 
saying that the payload is V4 and V6, doesn't talk about neighbor discovery, uh, duplicate addresses section, interface uh, identifiers, all those stuff. So IP, IPv6 over foo doesn't exist anywhere. So there's probably a need for, for this specification. Next slide. So uh, next step, uh, improve uh, specifications, as I kind of uh, uh, said a few times. Um, is there any interest in inter in area? Uh, the, there were some discussions uh, with the AD, some ADs about where this uh, work should be. Currently, it's uh, side meetings in this, in this uh, week. Uh, we had one on Tuesday, uh, one tonight at 6 to 7 at Carlin 4. Next slide. And uh, so I'm not sure, you know, first is to inform you, I'm, I would be, I think it should be, it should come back some ways here to, at least for a cross review, if we have a, you know, working group or a home somewhere. Uh, but in the meantime, there's a, the, a mailing list called this space, uh, ietf.org and some, uh, you know, uh, drafts that you, can, you may read if you're interested. Any okay. comments or suggestions or questions? Yes, thank you very much. So we have a number of people on the queue, but we're running out of time. So we're going to limit, uh, the queue is already closed, but we're going to limit uh, to one comment or question. So starting with Jorge. Yeah, hello guys. You know, this is a brief comment, you know, after, you know, participating in many interesting discussions, some, some of them confusing on the email lists, you know, about what it takes, you know, to establish communications with deep space. You know, during our discussions on the email list, there was a lot of uh, uh, lack of understanding of how deep space communications work and what are the challenges and the limitations of each of the links, you know, like bandwidth, power, you know, the opportunity to connect with uh, any spacecraft in orbit or in a planetary body. You know, there is a lot of value to have, you know, a discussion about where IP can be used on a planetary basis, on, on what pieces of the architecture can be used. But trying to tweak existing protocols after spending so many years on an architecture that we already put together on the IRTF and IITF, you know, for what we call DTN, uh, that is Delay and Disruption Tolerant Networking, is like uh, completely being ignored by this uh, draft. And I don't think it's uh, of much value to try to tweak existing protocols that have been developed, you know, for other use cases, trying to adapt them without having a clear understanding on what it takes to move bits from planet A to planet B or through, you know, a network of planets or orbital objects, you know. I will expect, you know, a little bit more work on this and also a, a better understanding on what it takes, you know, to evaluate how much work we had to put on making things that are not designed to this to work. Thank you. Thank you. Um, yeah, more work to do. <laughs> and uh, I think uh, Harley was... Uh, um, 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 referring to the deep space mailing list. So there's archive, you can look at the, the discussions there. Thank you. Um, Stuart? I'll be really quick, because I know we have 15 minutes left. For yeah, and, and there's actually... Yeah. Um, uh, I, I'm interested, I, I think this is an interesting approach. I, I think I'm ideologically aligned with, with your idea of reusing instead of reinventing. Uh, one little nit, because I'm sure you'll give this presentation again. You said IP has no notion of time. It's not quite right. The IPv4 time to live was a time to live. Yes. It's the, it's the number of seconds it takes to yes. forward a packet rounded up to the next whole number of seconds. Who, is, who has implemented this nowadays? Uh, well, I agree, but 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 um, saying it has no notion, I think, is glossing over a detail. Yeah. Um, in v6, they recognized that, and it became a hop camp. But yes. 
but TCP has a concept of the maximum segment lifetime, which informs when it can safely reuse a sequence number. Yeah. So yeah, um, TCP is out it's of. a very minor point, but you know, when you say IP and protocols have no notion of time, you're kind of glossing over details there. They do have notions of time, and I think we can fix that. That's not a fatal flaw. You're talking about TCP or IP? Um, because IP, you know. If, if we go back to history, the IPv, T TCP is, I, I, is not, is IPv4 not. tried to guarantee yeah, I know. <laughs> how late a packet could be delivered so that the layers above could make informed decisions about when it's safe to reuse identifiers like yeah. sequence numbers. So there is a tie in there. Uh, yeah. I'll stop. We have more. Yeah, thanks. Tim? Uh, Tim Chan, very quick. I think we need to update 1149. You can give them oxygen tanks, but if they flap, they won't go anywhere in space. <laughs> Alexander Pelf, just a super short comment. So when in Sheik, when we started working the work on, on bringing IP to LP1s, like these are technologies that are super slow. And initially it was like, okay, we need to tweak a lot of timers and stuff, but we managed to get it there. So you could run an SSH, uh, an SSH over LoRaWAN. It could take you 10 minutes to get your page, but you could do that. Yeah. So I think there are things to look there. And I really like this approach where we, you know, go into the, 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 the this, discussion of, okay, how can we reuse the, the stacks that in this architecture we already know, um, mm -hmm. so that, you know, when we have many interplanetary stuff, you know, we, we, we use the same technologies, right? Thank you very much. So we're out of time and we are moving to the next presentation now. So that'll be uh, Lynn. Hello, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, I would like to share my slides. Oh. Oh, I share my screen. It's usually better with the pre shared slides. So can you try again to share your slides, please? Because uh, we don't have your slides. Lynn? Lynn? OK, maybe we lost him. So can we move to the next one and see if he pops up? So Fred? Yes, do you hear me? We can, yes. Do you have my charts there or do I need to share them? Oh, here comes Lynn back on. Sorry for the mistake. Okay. So, Just, it's my turn or? Yeah. Uh, okay. <laughs> um, let's see. It's not. So we're having an issue with your slides, Lynn. Um, maybe you can, uh, we can move to the next presentation and you can uh, propose your slides. Uh, I have proposed my slides. Um, okay, so, so we'll move to the next presentation because I think you did that uh, very recently. So while Fred is presenting, we will come back to you. Okay, we'll, thank you. Thank you. So Fred, can you share your screen? Or you want us to share the slides? Uh, can you share the slides, please? Um, one second. OK. 
Okay. Uh, I don't see them in the mythical options, so can you share them from your side, Fred? Sharing screen. Okay. Do you see my charts? Not yet. Okay. So this is not looking good. Now we don't see the the slide on the mythical. We try proposing yeah. share slides. Yeah, I'm, I'm granting you access, but uh, apparently we lost. I see you uh, online. But, uh, OK. You're not seeing my charts? Not yet, no. OK, it's not giving me an option to which ones I share as to share screen. Okay, so we're a little stuck here because well, can you see? It proposed the charts. I proposed so the charts two days ago. Yeah, yeah, and uh, we uploaded them and we just don't see them in the pre search Do you? Let's try something else. Are you now seeing my screen? Yes, now we can. OK. All right, so let me talk now about uh, internet extension for the internet protocol. We, uh, we this see is a present. Sorry, Fred, we see your screen, but it's uh, your email with a whole bunch of uh, windows. Very frustrating. Um, have my charts up on the screen now, and that's the best I can do. So maybe you have to share two screens? Firefox. No, I don't have two screens. Select window or screen. Entire screen. Allow. Now? No, we still see your email. No, actually, the, your mythical browser. in an infinite loop. And, and I, I have no idea how to work this tool. I'm sorry. Can I, can I mail you the slides? Yep. You see the slide? It's been mailed to you now. Okay. Are you sharing? Just click and confirm. Okay. Okay. There you go. Okay. Very good. Uh, so this is a talk entitled Internet Identification Extensions for the Internet Protocol. Um, this is from Fred Templin of the Boeing Company. I work for a group called Boeing Research and Technology. Next chart, please. So the motivation for this is that some transports, for example, NFS over our UDP get better performance using segment sizes that exceed the path MTU and invoke IP fragmentation. It's confirmed by modern network performance analysis tools such as iPerf3. And we examined the, the Licklider transmission protocol for over UDP uh, in the NASA high rate DTN and JPL overlay 
uh, network uh, interplanetary relay network distributions. Um, the test bed setup that we had is two Dell Precision 3660 workstations with uh, 12th generation Intel Core i7s, um, Intel E810, uh, 100 gigabit per second Ethernet NICs connected point to point, and we ran LTP, UDP, IPv4 over the point to point Ethernet. Next chart. So this is a chart of the performance that we got with the Ethernet interface M MTU set to 1500 bytes. Along the x-axis, we have the LTP segment size in bytes. Along the y-axis, we have the data rate in megabits per second. The magenta curve is the HDTN LTP performance. Uh, the green, yellow, and blue curves are iPerf using UDP and TCP with the average and peak rates for TCP shown in blue and yellow. So down in the lower left, you can see that when we had uh, the LTP segment size set to 1400 bytes, we got a maximum performance of nine gigabits per second. But when we boosted the LTP segment size to 16K bytes, which invoked fragmentation over a 1500 MTU link, we got 18 0.125 gigabits per second, which is nearly double what we get when we don't invoke fragmentation. So this is a very important result. We're showing better performance when intentionally invoking fragmentation using a packet size, a segment size that exceeds the MTU. And we did see similar performance profiles under the ion emulation testbed as we did with HDTN. Next chart. What this is showing now is moving the Ethernet MTU to 4,500 bytes. And with 4,500 byte MTU, when we sent an MTU size segment, we got 20 gigabits per second. But when we invoked fragmentation, we got as high as 27K gigabits per second. So again, we see a gain for using fragmentation over unfragmented packets. Next chart. We then boosted the Ethernet MTU to 9702 bytes. And with that size, with an MTU sized segment size of 9,600 bytes, we got 29 gigabits per second. And then we got slightly higher when we invoked fragmentation for 16K segment sizes and 64K segment sizes. So we still see a gain for freeze and fragmentation. Next chart, please. So the implications of all this study is that we found that fewer and larger segments perform better than more and smaller segments. And this has been confirmed by INLTP large segment performance versus GSO, GRO, and LTP. We see that fragmentation, IP fragmentation, is, does better than GSO, GRO. Um, we found that increasing the path MTU and using transport protocol segments close to the MTU size significantly increases performance. But the thing is that most internet paths are still 1500 bytes or smaller uh, in path MTUs. So the, the key thing is that using transport protocol segments that exceed common internet size path MTUs significantly increases performance when IP fragmentation is invoked. Um, performance also increases to a lesser degree when IP fragments are invoked over larger MTUs. Larger segment sizes improve performance by reducing header overhead. We get better performance when we have all large segment fragments in the fragmentation chain. And we get poor performance when we have a tiny fr small fragment, like a 1400 plus 100. So what this means is that we need to have a robust IP fragmentation reassembly service for performance maximization. But the best common practice that we have currently says IP fragmentation considered fragile. That's RFC 8900. So what we're proposing is an update to RFC 8900 which we're calling identification extension for the internet protocol. Next chart. So the first issue that we have to address is the identification length. The IP ID is 16 bits for IPv4 and 32 bits for IPv6. But the problem with that is that data corruption is possible if the IP ID wraps or collides within the maximum datagram lifetime. Um, so what we need is a longer IP ID to ensure reassembly integrity and identification uniqueness. So the solution that we're proposing is a new IPv4 option for IPv4 packets 
or a new IPv6 extended fragment header for both IPv6 and IPv4 packets. Now we're considering both of these solutions in parallel. Next chart. The second problem is that the loss unit is smaller than the retransmission unit when you have IP fragmentation invoked. Um, the problem that, ca that that causes is that you can have cascading retransmissions based on fragment loss due to persistent con congestion or disruption. So what we need is a fragmentation reassembly feedback from intermediate and end systems. So the solution that we're proposing is a new code in ICMPv6 packet two big messages. Codes one and two are sent by fragmenting the intermediate systems to request smaller fragments. Codes three and four are sent by reassembling end systems to request smaller fragmented packets. The messages are sent subject to rate limiting and they're wrapped in UDP IP headers to avoid filtering. And the source responds by adapting its segment and fragment sizes. So uh, we're running out of time, and we have okay. one person in the queue. So if one, you can wrap up one in more, one minute. One more chart should do. So IP fragments are uh, systematically dropped along some paths. The problem is that fragment drop in middle boxes, uh, some IPv4 network middle boxes filter based on protocol and port numbers, some IPv6. Uh, middle boxes drop all packets with IP6 fragment headers. So the the need is to, is end to end fragmentation parameter tra transport, and the solution that we have is called deep packet and fragmentation. So let's go to the final chart, and this is a pointer to the draft. There's been some preliminary list discussion, some off list comments have been received, and we want to look at adopting this as a working group document. And that's the end of the presentation. Thank you. So we have one comment from Lorenzo. Yeah, uh, Lorenzo Caliti. Generally speaking, I consider any use of fragmentation as waiving the sender's rights to have any, any successful communication. It just like doesn't work. Uh, one thing though, I think in a, in a sort of like constrained network, in a controlled network it might work. One thing though, I'm very surprised by these benchmarks because every time I've tried to benchmark IPERF with fragmentation, what happens is that any amount of loss that's not trivial will cause uh, the, the reassembly buffer to be clogged up with the fragments that never go away. And what happens is eventually the, segment, the reassembly buffer just gets full and nothing else gets through. And this is a really pathological failure mode for fragmentation, which you, you gotta be careful of if you want to do this over the internet because you can have unpredictable loss. So I, I think it's a little bit harder than you, than you would think based on your data. Because you, you had these machines back to back, right? So, but on the internet is a very different story. Thank you. So. Hello, Edgar Ramos from Ericsson. Um, I actually have maybe a follow-up comment to that because in the figures that were shown, I suppose those are for one particular object or one particular uh, flow of data. And I wonder what happened with the rest. So if you have a, a certain amount of um, traffic going on through one of these routers. And then you take this router and you do this segmentation. It might be an implementation issue that you basically wait uh, to get all the packets that are for one segment and then push it out. And then of course you get better, better throughput for that particular use, but what happened with the rest? So then my question is, um, is it the overall performance being considered? Okay. Thank you very much. And we're out of time now, so good for, for thought. Thanks, everyone, and thanks a lot for staying a few more minutes. Uh, uh, sorry about the people that we didn't make it to the presentation. Hopefully next time, or uh, keep discussing on the mailing list. Bye-bye. Thank you. Thanks.